So welcome, intro to charcuterie. I'm Meredith Lee. I work part-time for Living Web Farms, which is a sponsor of this event. Living Web Farms is a research and education farm in Mills River, North Carolina. If you haven't heard of it, you should check it out at livingwebfarms.org. We do year-round classes on farming, gardening, cooking, sustainable living, and we provide free video archives of every class that we do on the website. So you can look at quite, you spend quite a lot of time <laughs> learning everything that we've done thus far at Living Web Farms. In addition, we have lots of alternative energy projects. We do soil microbiology. We do a lot of really cool stuff, open for visits. Um, so that's that. And you can get a schedule of classes on the website as well. Um, and we'll be posting new events probably this fall for next year. Um, and then on my off time, I work for myself. I'll let everybody kind of file in here. I had a farm for 13 years at an old fort, raising beef, pork, lamb, and poultry, organic vegetables, and cut flowers. Um, also opened a butcher shop a few years back. Um, it's Foothills Deli and Butchery over on Hilliard. If you guys are interested in checking it out, um, it's no longer my store. I sold my half of it. Um, but in, since I've sort of phased out of farming and retail butchery, I have written a book. And I've spent the last year working on the Ethical Meat Handbook, which is um, outlined on this postcard here. You can take one if you're interested. You can pre-order the book from now until October 1st, and you get a signed copy in the mail with a free gift. Um, it's being published um, October, November of this year. So we're here to talk about meat preservation. The book covers pretty much, it attempts to cover, as well as it can in 300 pages with only 250 black and white photos, incorporating animals into a vegetable holding and just discussing how animals are integral to really sustainable agricultural enterprises. Then it also talks about whole animal butchery, coming from the whole animal down to the cuts that you're used to seeing at the grocery store in the retail case for beef, pork, lamb, and poultry. And then it also has a chapter on charcuterie, which is the subject of today's class. So charcuterie is a French term that, incorporate, that is an umbrella term for all different types of meat that is preserved via salt, smoke, and or dehydration. If you've heard the word salumi or heard someone referred to as a salumist, that is the equivalent word in Italian. So salami is a specific product of charcuterie or salumi. Charcuterie and salumi are the, is just the umbrella term for all those processes. Um, I prefer charcuterie for some reason. I, have, I took French for a long time when I was a kid. Maybe that's why. But in your handout, if you wouldn't mind just following along, the pictures are a little bit small. But I figured it would be easier to provide this for you instead of rambling on about ratios and numbers because it gets a little heavy. Um, so the first picture you see there is a picture of a pig. And you can, you can preserve other types of meat too. Um, and if you have questions about that, feel free to holler out as we go along. And I'm happy to talk about how you could complete the process for bacon with a certain cut of beef or lamb if you're interested in those species instead. But when it comes to charcuterie, pig is sort of king. So that's why we're you know, um, starting there. So you'll see a picture of the pig there and you'll see how it's divided into four or five parts. These parts are considered the primals. So whenever you break an animal down, the first largest parts it's broken into are the primals. After that, the subprimals, and then the retail cuts. Um, the pig practically has four primals, shoulder, loin, which is back meat, belly, and ham. I included the head because it's super valuable, and lots of people don't think of it as such. And so I just want to get everyone thinking about that. Especially in charcuterie, the head is preserved via head cheese. The jowls, often if you've heard of guanciale, it's a dry cured, um, heavily herbal, sort of like pancetta, but, just, but a, little bit, a little bit different and from a different part of the body. Um, from a shoulder, typical things, you know, charcuterie items that you may have heard of, um, capicola, if anyone's familiar, or capa. Yeah. Um, lots of salami and sausage made from shoulder meat. Um, from the loin, typically this meat is eaten fresh because it's the highest value meat that we sell fresh, loin meat. That's your ribeye, that's your New York strip. But it can also be processed and preserved. Um, one of the most prominent items, preserved items from the loin is, is uh, lomo or lonzito, lomo embuchado if you've heard of it. That's uh, pretty much, if you've ever seen a boneless pork loin roast, if you took that and you dry cured it and you air dried it, it would be a lomo. Um, also, lardo is back fat that's preserved. Um, 
And then I like to use the sirloin for making salami, and I really love to use it for making tasso, which is a hot smoked cured item. Um, from the ham, we all know prosciutto, speck. Um, there's a couple different cuts from there, um, from more from the Italian way of butchering a pig. Um, one is called the culatello, and it is practically it's the bottom round, top and side round, and eye of round from the entire leg. And it's often the boneless ham used in curing, so it'll be, um, it'll be cured just like a prosciutto, prosciutto in salt, um, and then it'll be hung and fermented. The, the main difference there is that a prosciutto typically has the bone in it. Um, Culatello is also the cut that you, that's used for speck most often. And then if you take all that off the leg, um, and the, then the only thing that's remaining is this uh, piece of the quad muscle right above the knee. It's called the fiocchetto in Italian, which is Italian for bow tie. And that's used for a lot of ham, cured hams. I like to brine it and smoke it. It's a really delicious, um, just kind of like a little nice four to five pound sized ham. Um, then from the belly, we all love bacon, pancetta, which is differenti differentiated from bacon in that it is not smoked, it is never cooked, it's air cured. Um, and you'll see, you'll see other things written on there, but I use the same diagram for when I'm talking about fresh meat butchery and also charcuterie, so you can just ignore those. Um, so, launching from there, we'll kind of talk about all those things if you're interested, if you have other questions. Is this the it, is. it is. Come on in. Sorry, I'm late. That's okay. <laughs> Squeeze yourself in. If anybody has an extra handout. Okay, great. So the plan today is that I'll kind of break all the kind of different processes or the way I think about charcuterie into four different types, four different groups. And then we're gonna do a little bit or taste a little bit from each group. We might, we not, might not be able to carry the process forward. One of the things about charcuterie is that it is artisanal through and through. So it takes a long time to do a lot of these things. We won't actually be able to complete all the products tonight in class. Um, but like we said, we're preserving meat via salt, smoke, and dehydration. I like to break it down as follows in my head. Fresh sausages, that's the first one. It's the easiest one to learn. It provides a really good foundation in terms of ratios. If you're looking to learn charcuterie <laughs> in the whole gamut, I think you should start there. After that, we move up into emulsified sausages, and that's going to be like your bologna. Um, hot dogs, we're really familiar with that. Pâtés are also considered an emulsified sausage. They're just not in a casing, typically. Um, What's that mean, emulsified? Emulsified, an emulsification is a dispersion of something into something that it's not typically soluble in, right? So when we think about mayonnaise, that's like eggs and oil, um, or oil within eggs. So um, and like butter. Butter is a great example of emulsification. In the case of meat, it's going to be lean meat, fat, and liquid in a specific ratio. And depending on the extent of the emulsification, like the finest emulsifications will be those where you cannot discern the difference between the meat, the fat, and the water on your tongue. It's fat just, you would you use fat from it would be pork fat. Yes. Yeah, yes. typically. If you're emulsifying the fat of the same. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, if you, if you wanted to make an emulsification, it would, be, it would be harder to make an emulsification with other species other than pork. It can be done, but typically you would use a little bit of pork fat in that process because pork fat is the easiest to work with in an emulsification process. Is it rendered? No, it's usually fresh. Um, then we move on to whole muscle cures. Um, that's gonna be like your bacon, your tasso, your prosciutto. And so these, th these are either dry cured or wet cured. Sometimes wet cured is referred to as brining. So we'll talk about both of those things. And then we move into the grand telos, which is the um, fermented sausages. These are your salamis. Um, and they're the most difficult to make. Um, so in, in general, and, and I guess it's, it's useful to mention that a lot of times, one or more processes will be combined. In, in creating a product. So it's not gonna be just an emulsification or it's not gonna be just a dry cure. Sometimes it can be both. Um, and in general, the process relies on the activity of salt to dehydrate the meat. That is the process that's going to be preserving the meat, um, is the just reduction in water activity. So we talk about water activity, we're not talking about the water that's there, we're talking about the water that's available for bacteria to act on. So if I take a piece of meat, like this pork belly, it has a specific water activity right now. I put it in the freezer. 
all the water turns to crystals, the, wa the water activity drops to zero because there's no water available to be worked on. It doesn't mean it doesn't have any moisture in it. As soon as I pull it out of the freezer, it becomes water active again. Water activity is measured in units AW. Um, you can get special water activity meters. Not necessary if you're just starting, but if you're getting into it on a professional level, it's probably a good idea. Um, because you can measure water activity and below 0.92, it's considered shelf stable. So if you're in a commercial business, that's one of the measures you would use to you know, prove to the health department that you could put that thing on the shelf without refrigerating it. Um, and then we also work with bacteria, the beneficial processes of fermentation and curing to ferment flavor and cure the meat, enhance color, etc. cetera. Um, so we'll start with fresh sausage. I thought we would make a little bit in class. It might be a little goofy because nothing's frozen, but we do what we can. Um, so what I have here is pork. I believe it's from the shoulder. Some of it's from the sirloin. Do you prefer for it to be frozen? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I always want to keep things as cold as possible. And it might depend on your grinder. If your grinder's not a powerful grinder, if it's a hand crank grinder, you might not be able to work with totally frozen product. When I, I mean, when I had a butcher shop, I was working with like a huge Vero grinder and Thing could, things could be stone frozen when I put them in there. Um, but when I, was, when I started writing the book, I decided to buy equipment that I felt was realistic for people on the home scale. And so every recipe in the book is made with this KitchenAid mixture, mixer and this Chef's Choice sausage grinder, which I really like as opposed to the meat grinder that comes with the KitchenAid or that is advertised by KitchenAid because that one has plastic parts and it's really hard to keep them cold they're also not gonna be as strong. So the chef's choice is about 90 bucks, $95. And I have found that it's really good for like 10 pound batches of sausage. It holds up pretty well. There is one piece, somebody in one of my classes told me there's a piece inside of here that's plastic that will break eventually. And I'll probably have to replace it, but it is replaceable and it's not a big deal. So I think this is a pretty safe bet for somebody on the home scale. I don't know, this is a professional 600. <laughs> And and oh, this? Is, yeah, no, yeah, which, uh, professional which 600 is professional what it says here. Yeah. So <laughs> this retail thing for about $300. This is about $100. You can buy a tabletop grinder for $400, you know, an LEM product or an ultra source product. Um, I would just say try for stainless steel. If you're going to spend on a specialized product, like look for one that can grind up to 10, 15 pounds of sausage at a time. Um, Typically, I would freeze all the moving parts before I started. So I'd throw all these in the freezer. This meat has been trimmed, and it's ready to go. It's in, a lot of people say, square it. But my grinder is not, my grinder is long. So it makes more sense to me to put it in these strips. So you cut them in the strips and then put them in the freezer? Mm -hmm. And then I put these in the freezer. Um, so you always want everything to be as cold as possible. And what you're going for is, perf is the proper ratio. That's sausage math, which is something my boyfriend makes fun of a lot. Um, <laughs> so for fresh sausage, we're looking at 70% lean meat, 30% fat, and you want back fat or belly fat. So you want this firm, nice fat. You don't want subcutaneous fat, a runny, weird, soft, mm -hmm. squidgy fats, um, because they're gonna turn the grind. Yeah. Uh, other than the difficulty, Um, well, I think if you're working with a fresh product like this and you just open freeze it enough to where it's crunchy on the outside and fresh on the inside, you're not going to get any off flavors or weirdness from the freezing process. Also, one thing to consider if you're working with pastured pork, it can, although very rarely, be infected with um, trichina, which is a parasite. It's the same thing that people worry about with wild game. Um, and the only way to ensure that the tr it's totally trichina free is to freeze it for 20 days or more. So a lot of people are, have already gone ahead and frozen their product before they started. Um, also, if you, break down a, if you break down a half pig, which I highly advise, because it's gonna save you money, it's gonna help a farmer, um, you probably aren't gonna be able to work that whole half animal in the amount of time that you need before it goes bad. So you're gonna be freezing some stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. um, Can I in, just ask, how, when you freeze, how, you freeze 20 days, kills the chicken oma, how deep of a freeze are you doing? Uh, it's supposed to be like negative 10, I think. Um, I, I'd have to look it up to be okay. sure. Yeah, um, so I thought I would show how the grinder goes together. 
It's nice to have a little bit of vegetable oil on the outside of this. Just keep it nice and lubed. There's a little O-ring you don't ever want to lose right there. This is the shaft, I suppose. This is the worm. It goes in like this. This is your knife. A lot of people think it goes in like that, but it doesn't. It goes this way. Your plate, you'll have two. This is the coarse grit plate, forget the size, 5 eighths millimeter. Anybody know that in inches? And then there's a small one, which is what you're using for hot dogs and emulsified products. I didn't bring that one with me. Um, there's a little pen, you can see. Fit this over top of it. You screw this bad boy on. And fit it into here. Nice and snug. I've found that if I get really excited with my frozen pork sometimes, if I don't have this screwed on really tight, the whole thing will turn on me. So you just have to make sure it's on there. So 70% lean, 30% fat, 1.75% salt. You want to use kosher salt. Doesn't matter if you use Diamond Crystal or Morton's, but you want to make sure you're weighing it whichever one you're using because Diamond Crystal is hollow crystals and Morton is flat flakes and they weigh different. I use Morton's just because I like the girl with the umbrella. No other reason than that. And um, I found that 1.75% ratio is really perfect for fresh sausages. A lot of recipes will say 2%, but it's too high for fresh sausages. Um, then you want 10 to 14% liquid. Liquid can be water, but it shouldn't be. It should be broth, stock, wine, liqueur, um, cream. Whatever. Is it uh, canning salt the same as kosher? I think it is. Is canning salt the same Super as kosher fine. salt? Super it's fine. just really fine. Just weigh it. As long as you're weighing it and you have that ratio so right, don't worry about it. yeah, okay. you'll please the best salt so snobs. Is there a reason why you couldn't use fancy pink salt and stuff? Well, it would be kind of a waste. And also, sea salts are a little bit inconsistent, you know? Mm -hmm. They have a lot of minerals in them, and they're not like, they're just not. They're not consistent. You know, a lot of people doing whole muscle cures, a lot of really die-hard charcuterists will only use sea salt. Um, I think it's best when you're learning and getting your ratios down to just work with kosher salt. You know, just start there. If you're using like really fancy salts, it's like why put in a sausage? You know, like you, you can't see it. No one will know. You know what I mean? Yeah. What'd you say? For the minerals. Yeah. 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 I mean, good point. Um, you might get varying results, that's all I would say. Um, and it can be expensive. Um, so my experience with bad sausage is that it's either the salt is wrong, it's way too salty or it's not salty enough. It's dry, the eating experience is dry because the liquid is not right or the bind and the texture is wrong. You know, it's just like, it's either like too finely ground or it's, you know, like clunky, and I feel like that has to do with equipment. You know, you have to know your machine. If you're working with a super powerful machine, it's just gonna start to emulsify everything really fast, you know, so you've got to like figure out how to use that machine. If your parts start to get dull, that's another thing that'll mess up your texture. Also, we'll talk about um, a standard like grind and then put half of it back through and regrind, and that gives you a little bit of coarser stuff and a little bit of more finely ground stuff, and I think that really helps with the texture, the good eating experience. Also doing that is gonna help the spices and everything bind better to the meat, which is gonna make a better product. Um, also the liquid. A lot of master recipes will say 10% flat for fresh sausages, but that's ridiculous. You have to be flexible with it. If you're using a lot of dry spices, it's gonna take away from how much liquid is in it, so you really need to adjust. Um, in the book, I, you know, if you, if you get the book and you look at those recipes and you do that math, you'll see that some of the recipes have the liquid right at 10% and some of them have as much as 14%. It just depends on what's going on in the recipe. Um, so what I have done is I've gone ahead and mixed up my, my stuff. And I can give you this recipe if I think really hard. This is two and a half pounds of pork lean. It is one pound of pork back fat. It is one ounce of kosher salt, 0.7 ounces of fresh ground black pepper, three tablespoons of garlic, a little bit of thyme, and three quarters of a cup of white wine. It's really simple. I always mix before I grind. A lot of people do the opposite, but I think it's just, you know, if you're trying to mix everything in after you've ground it, you have a really 
high chance of having little clumps of seasoning. Have you ever had a bite of sausage where you just have like a little, kind of like you're making pancakes and there's little lumps of flour in it? Mm -hmm. um, and so this really, you know, this really ensures better work through of the spices. As it's grinding through the grinder, it's gonna obviously mix itself in to the meat. So I just, you know, it's okay to mix this in and then open freeze it if, you're, if you want to, or leave it overnight, heck, you know, let it marinate, no big deal. This wine, I could put in afterwards. I may put a little bit in now. And then black pepper, thyme, garlic. Salt, one ounce of salt. Um, so, this is gonna be really loud for a moment. And the meat is not frozen, so what you may see happening on this end is a bit of smearing. That's when the fat comes to the melting point and it starts to squish, and that's not a good thing. Um, but we'll see, what, we'll see how we do. We're doing okay, it looks all right. I don't, I just have the one I'm going off of, but I can give it to you when I'm done. I'm sorry. I feel a little meat on you in the front row, I'm sorry. Now, so to help my bind and my texture, I'm going to take half of what I just sent through and I'm going to send it through again. I could switch out the plate, but why do that? It's like, just send it back through. Yeah. Send it back through a third time if you feel like it. But really, I mean, for, for general, standard, everyday sausages, this is going to do it for you. I put this on like a four to six when I'm grinding, just in case you're using this model. I'm move this away. You can see the difference as it comes out. Saw that? What's that? It is now, yeah. What's that? Go for it. Yeah. Yeah, do your, yo do your yoga. <laughs> Sometimes you do, and also what, what will happen with a hand grinder, you have to be very meticulous about getting like fascia and silver skin off the meat because it'll bind up really easily. This, is, this and some of the larger commercial grinders 
that knife that I threw in there will really just catch all that silver skin on the back side of it really well. When I pull it out in a minute, you can see it'll probably have gathered a little bit of silver skin across the back of it. You have to spend more time processing, and then, you know, it's a workout, right, to get it. I use a vertical stuffer, so that's a hand crank, so by the time I'm done, you know, set and done with grinding and stuffing, it's like, how much can my elbow really take, you know? I don't advocate a, the stuffer that comes with this because it works like this one does with this action. So you're, you're constantly stuffing the meat into it, which is just introducing air into the product. And air is the number one enemy of sausage, especially when you're stuffing it. So, you, you know, the, the reason I like the vertical stuffer is because you put all the meat in there and it's got this press that comes down with an air, a little air uh, release valve. And so it's already in there, it's pressed down, and then you start cranking and it's coming out with, with no air in it, or very little air in it. So you can see the difference here between the two. And I mean, this is like, this is good stuff, you guys. This is like secret stuff. You go into retail butcher shops and you see sausages that are like way over ground. Yeah, you're gonna be making some professional sausages. See how easy this is? Why aren't you grinding your own beef, you know? Also, you don't have to stuff. We won't be stuffing tonight because my stuffer is back at the manufacturer. It had some kind of problem with it, so I had to send it back. But you can just eat it, you know, bulk. You can just pack it like this, done and done. Super easy, super quick. This is going to give me about four and a half pounds of sausage right now. Get the rest of the wine in there. I'm gonna have to drink out of that jar. Um, let me mix everything together. And then I might have Pat start cooking up some patties. Is that okay with you, Pat? And that way everybody can get a taste of this before we go. You wanna look through it, you always wanna taste it after you grind it. If you're gonna stuff it, make a little two, three inch patty, throw it in a pan. If you don't like it, you can always add more salt, add more liquid, add more seasonings after the fact, and then just mix it around in a bowl. Yeah, this would be in a bowl, except I forgot one. So here we are on a sheet pan. The what? Okay. See if there's anything I forgot to say about sausages. Oh, when you stuff standard sausage, use a natural hog casing that comes from the small intestine of a pig. There are other synthetic casings, but mm -hmm. I like to use natural casings whenever possible. They come from the intestines of hogs and, be and beef cattle. Um, sheep as well. If you're making those little breakfast links, that's a sheep casing. I get my casings from Butcher Packer, butcher-packer.com. It's a really good place to get small amounts of things. There's a lady in Concord, North Carolina, that does really nice casings. Her lady is Cindy. Her business is called Tri-State Casings but she mostly works with commercial producers. That's where I got all my casings when I did my shop. But it's gonna be large, large quantities. But if we get lots of like meat cures clubs going on, maybe we can all go in on some orders together. For now, Butcher Packer is the spot, I think. Um, and they also sell equipment, they sell scales. As you can see, you're gonna need a really nice fine-tuned kitchen scale for this process. You wanna get one that's digital. It'd be good if it has grams and ounces because you'll find recipes that use metric as well as our newfangled silly stuff. Butcher Packer um, is located where? They're in Michigan. Michigan. Um, so when you stuff, I'll just describe the process since we're not doing it now. That would probably take me about 10 feet of hog casings and that would give me a standard size like this big sausage, like a bratwurst Italian sausage size um, sausage. And so what you do with the casings, they'll come packed in salt. That's the way to preserve them. You don't ever want to freeze them because then they can get ice crystals in them and then it'll poke a little hole in the casing. So you just want to make sure they're always packed in salt. Kosher salt is fine. I keep them in the bottom drawer of my refrigerator, like the little meat drawer. Um, they come in hanks. A hank is like 100 yards, I think. Um, so you get a lot in one hank. Um, 
And so what you'll do is you'll rinse them thoroughly. You can like hook the end of it over your faucet and let the water run through it. And you can sort of like run it around in there. Um, I always feel really funny when I get the casings out, but then as soon as I start working with them, I really love them. They feel so nice. <laughs> Anyways, so you get them all rinsed. How long are they like 50 feet long? Oh, it just kind of depends. I mean, they're pretty long. They're like, like I'm like, this is a yard, right? Your nose to your, so that's how I measure. So I do like three of these for a batch like that. Um, no spatula. Okay. Rats. Use a knife. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you'll rinse them off. You can soak them in tepid water f while you're grinding and everything. And then you'll get your stuffer. So it kind of looks like a big can. It's got an auger that goes down into it with a press under that. Then it has a horn that comes off. You'll get three different sizes. The middle size is the one you'll use for a standard sausage like this. Um, so you'll get it. You might want to put a little oil or some water on the horn. And then you load all the casings on like pantyhose. You bring them all onto the horn. Then you crank the sausage down until there's a tiny bit of it peeking out at the end of the horn. The reason you do that is because you go ahead and put, you extend the casing out and then you start cranking. You're just going to put a bunch of air in that very first sausage. So you want to make sure the meat is coming out slightly. Then you tie a bubble knot, which is just an overhand knot, double overhand knot um, at the end. And then you just go. You just go your own speed. You want to keep it, hold it kind of down. You don't want to hold it up or sideways because that helps air go into it. You want to hold it down. Have a pan or something underneath it um, and just let it, you know, just let it kind of flow. Um, and then when you get done, you'll have a big coil. And then you go, you take like a six inch piece and you want to pinch it and then twist it. You go down six inches, pinch it, twist it the opposite direction. Six more inches this way, six more inches that way. That way if you're going to hang them up, they're not just going to all come untwined. Um, it's best to be able to hang them up after you stuff them so they can dry. Um, that's really good if you want to smoke them because drying forms a, a layer of proteins on the casing called a pellicle, which helps the smoke really adhere. Also, um, as much as you can let them rest under refrigeration, the more that flavor is going to improve before they're actually cooked. If you're just poaching them or grilling them, it's not necessary to dry them out. You could eat them right away. But I just always like to leave enough time to, I really think this cooks hotter than it says it's cooking. Well, I, well, I just turn it down. Okay, so yeah, you're in charge. I think, I think so too. Um, and how long do you dry them for? Before? Just overnight. overnight, yeah. Like if I'm making hot dogs, I'll just like make them, throw them in there overnight, and then the next day smoke them. Um, do you have like a rack set on them? Or where you, where you hang stuff? Or yeah, well, I don't, I should. I just lay them out on a sheet pan and try to keep them, you know, and then maybe flip them. Um, and if you need to like wipe underneath them, you can. So it's best to hang them. Not under refrigeration. Yes, under refrigeration. Under refrigeration. Yes. Oh. This has raw meat on it. Okay. Look. Yeah, those are going to be the two. Sorry. It works. I didn't have one. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, I bought some sausage from a meat place in New Jersey. Here. Yeah. And this butcher told me that they put a chemical or something, some kind of ingredient in there to keep it from going bad. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to do that with all of this. Well, was it a was it a dry sausage? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's a different it's process. It's soft to the touch. Mm -hmm. it's but you don't have to cook it. You don't cook it. I bet that what that is, it's got a higher salt content. It's probably fermented slightly, and then it's probably smoked. If it wasn't smoked, then it was probably just air dried or dried in a charcuterie cabinet, and that will have nitrate in it, which will keep it, yeah, keep it fresh. It might also have other things like potassium sorbate or something in it. You don't really need that kind of stuff if you're just doing it on the home scale. Nitrate you do need, but the other stuff you don't. Fresh sausages are almost always going to be cooked. You don't need a nitrate in that. They're also not aging, so you don't need nitrite or nitrate in this. Really traditionally, all sausages were made with nitrites. Um, and a lot of diehards will be like, oh, you don't get the right color in your brat if you don't use a nitrite. But it doesn't matter. You know, like, why ingest nitrite when you don't need to? Yeah. So, um, so we don't use them for fresh sausages. So um, if you froze this to get rid of the parasites, then you could actually have this not be well done. But it should be well done anyway because it's a sausage, right? It should be well done anyway just because of other things that can go wrong with meat, right? had to freeze it because the trichinosis would be eliminated by cooking, right? I think trichinosis is actually not eliminated by cooking. Well, my group was always like, if it's not pink, 
He took care of the trichinosis. Interesting. I don't know that. I didn't know that. Anybody older remember that? Yeah. So yeah. cooking yeah. is also yeah. effective for trichina. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. trichina is also, it's of larger concern with whole muscle air cured items. So if it's never being cooked and it's never frozen, then a lot of times charcuterists will always look for certified pork, which means it's been frozen for that 20, 28 day period at a certain temperature. Um, but, but that makes sense then for what Pat's saying. So he's just going to cook those up. We'll taste them in a minute. Um, the best way to cook these, obviously, if you're not going to grill them or pan cook them, is to poach them. And poaching is just water cooking under 170 degrees. So um, that's our fresh sausage bit. Does anybody have the time? Seven and a half. Okay, great. Do we open a window? Do we open a window? Um, so we'll move on to emulsified meats. So this is going to be basically, a lot of them can be just like a fresh sausage. It's just a different ratio and they're going to be more finely processed. So an emulsified meat such as a mortadella, a bologna, a hot dog is going to have about 42% lean, 33% fat and 25% liquid. Those are really, the percentages are a little tedious. What you want is five, four, three, the ratio. So whatever quantities you're doing by weight, you want five, four, three, lean, fat, liquid. Um, you want up to 2% salt in emulsified products because they're most often served cold. Your palate cannot discern flavors as well in cold products as it can in hot products. So anytime you're serving something cold like a pasta salad or a emulsified mortadella, just make your seasonings a little bit more aggressive, up your salt a little bit. Um, Let's see, more aggressive seasonings. It's pretty much the same principles for making the product. So just what I did here, except you want to be really careful about temperature because the, the more you work the fat, the more chances it has to melt. So you just want to make sure um, that it's really cold the whole time. Also, ground products have more surface area. So that means more opportunities for bacteria to divide and reproduce. So anytime you're communating or grinding a product more and more and more, just make sure it's really cold. It's also easier that way. Like when I make pâtés, I almost always emulsify organ meat. I don't love to eat organ meat just like off the fork. I like to make it in a pâté, put it in, you know, some kind of mortadella, kidneys, hearts, livers especially. And it is so hard for me to work with those products when they're not stone frozen because they're slimy and they're bloody. And if I put them, I have little ice cube trays that are dedicated to liver where I will put the liver inside of them and freeze them. And then I can just drop them right into my grinder and send them through. I almost always also freeze the bowl that I'm going to be grinding into when I'm doing emulsifications so that my grinder's frozen, my product's frozen, and my bowl that's receiving it is frosted. Um, if you want, you're always going to use the fine plate for the emulsifications. Hardly ever are going to want to send it back through the grinder at that point because it's so fine, it's just going to stick to the grinder parts. So at that point, it's really helpful to have a food processor or a stick blender, which is my favorite, if you want it to be more comminated. You do have to be careful, though, because like any emulsification, it can break if you mix it too much. So you just want to watch it, make sure it's not starting to like string apart or space apart. That means you've broken the emulsification. And it probably won't cook right if you're going to do a water bath or you're going to smoke it. Actually. I think that happened a little bit with this bologna. I didn't make this bologna. It was given to me by um, my shop, my former shop. And I think the emulsification broke just a little bit on this one. It's not a big deal. It doesn't taste bad. Um, but you can see how it's just like a little bit spongy. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't quite cook right. It was like the casing was a little bit funny and it separated a little bit weird. So half of the entire, typically bologna is put into a, like a, like a synthetic, four or five inch casing. And so almost half of it was just like weird and, and amorphous and they couldn't sell it, you know? Um, this was the better side. What makes Don't worry. Versus salami, like what makes it bologna? It's multiplied. Well, a specific recipe most of the time. Like it depends. Lebanon bologna is almost always cold smoked. It has specific seasonings. Here in Appalachia, people tend to hot smoke their bologna. They put different things in it. I put liquor in mine, which people think is weird, but I don't care. Um, you can kind of do whatever you want, but bologna is always emulsified. It's almost always smoked. Whereas salami is, can be all different kinds of grinds and different seasoning mixes, and it's usually always fermented or air dried. Um, so 
Yeah, and the bologna, we would just make the emulsification. We would stuff it in a casing, we would dry it overnight, and then we would cold or hot smoke it after that. Done and done. Um, hot dogs, same way. You're making the sausage. A lot of people use a beef collagen casing for those, and they're dried overnight and then smoked, warm, cold or warm smoked. Can you define exactly what you mean by emulsifying? Yeah, so emulsification is basically dispersing something into something that it's not soluble with. Mm -hmm. um, so really it's just, it's like, it's like forcing, <laughs> it's like forcing something to dissolve in something that it isn't soluble in. Mm -hmm. And to combine it to where you can't discern the difference between item A from item B. So in this case, it will be on your tongue, you won't be able to tell the meat, the fat, and the liquid apart. So it's just gonna be very smooth. Mm -hmm. And emulsifications can vary, like this, is, is a, I would say a rougher emulsification, whereas if you've ever had a pate that was just so creamy and delicious, that's gonna be like your finest. A lot of times they'll put it through like a tammy or a chinois where they'll like brush it through the screen and just make it really, really fine. Um, and that's, that's advanced stuff because you have to be really careful. The more you work it, the more chance you have of messing it up, you know? Um, so there's also combination techniques. Um, so I was mentioning that before, like smoke in and of itself can be used to preserve meats. So in Inuit country, take a whole fish, they put in a cold smoker, that product is not being cooked. It's being, it's being dried out over a really long period of time and acted on by chemicals in smoke so that it's there, thereby preserved. That's charcuterie. Um, but the grinding, the curing and the smoking are a combination, it's an example of a combination technique that we use to create different products. So sometimes it'll be like, people will be like, what's the difference between pancetta and bacon? It's like, well, it's basically the same thing. It's one is smoked and one is not. That's it. Um, so moving on, we'll talk about whole muscle cures. I have a couple examples here. Can I use this? Yeah, sure. Probably. This is interesting. I need like one more. Every time I do this, I need one more vessel. Yeah. One extra vessel. Um, we'll try to be fast with this. So, whole muscle cures are very basically what they sound. They are an entire muscle, such as the pork belly, that is cured in a combination of salt, nitrite, and seasonings, sometimes a sweetener, usually a sweetener. Um, this is pork belly. It was a five pound piece. I trimmed it up a little bit, squared it off. And then one side of it, I just butterflied. I want this to be a pancetta. So if I'm gonna roll it, there's two types of pancetta. There's a rolled, and if I try to say that word in Italian, I'll just embarrass myself. There's pancetta stessa, which is cured flat. And then there's the rolled one, which I won't pronounce, which is what I'm doing. So I wanna increase you know, how thin it is and rollable it is. That's why I butterflied it. We'll do that in a second. This is this I'm gonna turn into bacon. I left the skin on because bacon is gonna be smoked. That skin is gonna hold a lot of moisture in as the product is cooking. I did take the nipples off because you don't really want nipples on your bacon. Um, once this is smoked, it's really easy to take the skin off. You just take one corner and you just pull it right off. It's super easy. Um, so what I've done, we're gonna talk about dry cures first, obviously. We don't have a demo for a wet cure today. This is my master dry cure. Move this? Yeah. Um, yeah. This is really, I mean, there's a few ways to do it, but this is, if you've ever filleted something, it's the same thing. This looked like this before. I just picked out where I thought was halfway. And you can, you know, you can get your knife in there and then just, this would be the improper way to do it. Get your knife underneath and then lock your wrist and push away from you. You can also, peel and make long cuts. When we cut meat, we don't want to saw like we're cutting bread. We're going to make confident, long strokes. Um, if this was a bigger piece of pork belly, you can spiral cut it, which is basically like butterflying it and then coming back another one and then going back the other way, right? So you're just cutting a spiral into it. So you, you can make it as thin and have a lot of surface area as possible. So that's, that's demonstrated in the book, so you can see pictures of it. Um, if you're making a porchetta or if you're doing like a really fine pancetta, that would be a great thing to do. This was just a funny, like all this is just fat at this point. So I thought, what's the point of going further and spiral cutting it? Um, 
So a dry cure, like I said, salt, nitrite, sweetener, and spices. You know what? Let's do the pancetta first. How do you buy a nitrate? Uh, Butcher Packer will have it. Okay. There's two different ones, and I can talk about that in a second. I'll talk about when we get to fermented sausages, just sort of the intricacies of nitrite and nitrate. One of the tricks I like to do is do a bunch of whole muscle cures at the same time, and then do my bacon last. So I make my bacon cure really simple, and then I do a bunch of other stuff like tasso and, and craziness on the same pan. So by the time I'm doing my bacon, it just has all these wild flavors in it from everything else I'm doing. And I don't have to like think too hard about what I'm putting on the bacon or make it special in any way. It's, it's just going to be amazing and different every time. So that's why I'm going to do the pancetta first. The pancetta is, whew, I don't have the recipe off the top of my head. It's in the book. You want to buy the book? It's, um, it's going to be salt, brown sugar. I put nitrate in this because I want to hang it for a long time. Um, some people just use cure number one or nitrite because they want to hang it a short amount of time. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's got juniper, nutmeg, um, black pepper, thyme, garlic. I think that's it. Um, so here's my pancetta cut. I'm just going to dump. This is enough for five pounds, so it's probably a little bit much. But that's okay. I'm just going to dump it out and rub it on real easy. It smells really good. Oh, it's got bay leaf in it, too. Yeah, it seems kind of intuitive you use dried herbs, but would you ever use with fresh herbs for sausages? Or fresh sausages, like yes. Cured sausages, I would be very careful. Um, plants with moisture still inside of them are going to emit heat. So as the product is curing or fermenting, it's going to do funky things to you. Yeah. I'm experimenting a lot. They told me I was going to get to do a workshop with Sander Katz next year where he was doing vegetable fermentation and I was doing meat fermentation. So I was working on all kinds of crazy mad scientist proje projects of like fermenting vegetables and incorporating them to the fermented meat. And so what I was doing was like fermenting stuff, dehydrating it, pulsing it in a food processor and creating my own like spice mixes. I'm still doing that to an extent. It's working really well for salamis. It still has a little bit of moisture in it, but if I'm managing pH okay, like it's working out fine. So I have this pancetta. I'm going to roll it up. I'm pretty excited about this. And I'm going to put it in a Ziploc bag. And I'm going to put it in my fridge. Uh, 10 days, maybe. 7 to 10 days. Every day I'll flip it over to make sure the cure is even. It'll start to, you know, leach a little bit. I just want to make sure that it doesn't just sit and it's leach it and cure. Flip it over. It's also called overhauling, if you ever heard anyone say that. Um, I wouldn't, you know, um, sometimes if I'm curing something for a really long time, like if I have a big muscle and I'm curing it three days per pound, say, I might drain it a little bit. If I'm salt curing a prosciutto, I'll put a tray under it so that the leach kind of comes out of it. So I want it to get as dry as possible before I hang it up. Um, but for something like this, it's no big deal. Um, then once I take it out of cure, I want to rinse the cure off completely. It kind of hurts a little bit. It hurts your heart. But you have to do it because if you don't, it's just going to taste, it's just going to be overwhelming. It's going to be crazy. So you got to, especially if you're using a nitrate or a nitrite, you don't want to just taste that. So you're going to rinse it off, get it as dry as possible, pat it dry, stick it in front of a fan, whatever you want. Then wrap it, I'll wrap this in two layers of cheesecloth, tie it every two inches with butcher twine and hang it up. I'll hang it up for maybe two weeks, maybe three. When I'm doing a rolled pancetta, I probably do it for a little bit longer because I want to make sure it's cured all the way through. General rule for hanging is you want it to lose 30 to 40 percent of its weight. So after I take it out of the cure, rinse the cure off, dry it, I'm going to weigh it, record the weight, record the date, hang it up, let it sit probably two weeks, then weigh it again. If it hasn't lost 30, 40 percent, put it back to hang. Um, but that's your general, if you're not using pH meters and crazy stuff like that, that 30, 40 percent weight loss is your best bet for when to harvest. That's air dried pancetta. I've made it under my kitchen cabinet. I've made it in my closet. I, my house dark. faces north, which I love because, you know, you just keep it for charcuterie. It needs to be dark. It needs to be dark because light turns fat rancid. So that's important. I have cured, like, my kitchen cabinet that I hang stuff under is here and my window is here. I've wrapped things in cheesecloth, a few layers, and hung it over here. And it's like, it hasn't been terrible. I did a Lomo there one time, and like the very outside layer of the fat was yellow. I just shaved it off, and it was not, it didn't affect the flavor too, too much. 
If you have a charcuterie cabinet, that's ideal. And I do have instructions in the book for how to build one, how to wire it. Um, and we might be able to get into that tonight if you're interested. I just don't know if we'll have enough time. Do you um, want good ventilation? Or is it good ventilation. You want humidity because if it dries out too quickly, it'll dry on the outside and get rotten on the inside. Um, so you want some humidity. That's why my kitchen is a great place because I'm cooking in there. There's water vapor. There's steam. You know, the sink is nearby. Um, but you don't want it to be like muggy. You don't want it to be hot. The ideal temperature is going to be 60, 70 degrees with probably 65, 70% humidity. Maybe even as low as 50 degrees. So like fall? Yeah, fall. The best time to cure meats, if you don't have specialized equipment, is going to be October to April. Summertime is kind of a nightmare. I just, I got all these salamis out recently and by the time it was done, I was like, oh, stick fork in me. Because it was so hot this summer that I was dealing with all kinds of crazy mold, fruit flies trying to get in my cabinet. Like it was just kind of a mess. And I, was, I said never again with ground product in the summertime because it was just kind of a nightmare. Anyways, moving on. This is my bacon. See, I have all this nice extra juniper and stuff in the pan. So I don't have to come up with my special perfect morning breakfast bacon cure. I just have a little leftover. This is a ma just a basic master dry cure. For five pounds of meat, it's 3.5 ounces of kosher salt, 1.75 ounces of brown sugar, one teaspoon of cure number one. That's sodium nitrite. I added some garlic. How do you experimented with your seasonings at all, or are these like traditional recipes from somebody else? I experiment a lot. Yeah. Um, this is this master cure. You will find probably in a million books. It's going to be a certain amount of kosher salt, pretty much exactly half that of brown sugar and then the federally recommended rate of nitrite per five or 100 pounds of meat. So that's basically what this is. Nothing special, nothing proprietary about it. Um, you can add anything you want, you know? You can add any spices, chipotle, what, you know, however you like to eat your bacon. So I'm gonna put this in a Ziploc. I'll leave it for 14 days and then pull it out, rinse it, get it as dry as possible, and then smoke it. Anytime you're smoking something, you want to get it dry, really, really dry. Stick in front of a box fan for an hour while you heat your smoker up, you know? Um, you put it in 14 days in a bag. You put it in the fridge in 14 days? Yep, in a bag. Overhaul it daily. In a bag. Okay. Yeah, if you don't remember to overhaul it daily, that's fine. Just remember to overhaul it, like, in even amounts of time. So if, it, yeah. if you went out of town for three days and it sat on this side, then flip it over this side and leave it for three days, you know what I mean? It just needs to be even, that's the point of it. Um, so, we're kind of done with that. Those are uh, examples of some dry cures. Some other examples would be a tasso, which is rubbed with um, some spicier seasonings, sometimes cinnamon, and then it's hot smoked. I like to use a sirloin for that, it's one of my favorite things to make. It's a great starting item for whole muscle dry cures because you can cure it for like three days and then smoke it and it'll still be delicious. Um, wet brine, or wet curing, also known as brining, um, is the same principle. A whole muscle is, Im is going to be immersed or pumped with a liquid solution that is made up of some type of liquid, salt, nitrite, sweetener, spices. Um, master brines are more difficult to throw around than master dry cures because it really depends on the type of meat, the size of the cut, um, the type of muscle it is. You know, so if it's like a belly like this, I can leave it in a brine with a lower degree of salinity for a shorter amount of time, but if it's a big old ham, I want a higher degree of salinity for a longer amount of time. If it's beef or poultry or beef or pork, I want 75 degree salinity. If it's poultry, I want 20. So it's like, it's talked about in more detail in the book. You can look at other resources for it. I recommend, um, it's like smoking, curing and smoking meats by Stanley and Adam Mariansky if you're really into wet curing. They talk about like injection pumps and syringes and using a salometer to get your brines right. And they have tables in the back for creating different degrees of brines. The book, my book gives you like a good master brine for beef and pork and a good master brine for poultry. And you can go from there. You'll be using a lot more salt and a lot more nitrite in a wet brine because it's just floating around in there and it doesn't pick up as much as it would if it was ground and then rubbed or if it was dry cured. So the federal allowances for nitrite in wet brines are higher. 
it's like 4.2 ounces per gallon of water, which is a lot more than 0.2 ounces per five pounds of meat dry cured. Um, nitrates and nitrates is just a type of salt? Or is it, it is. So we can... Think of fertilizer. <laughs> yeah, so that's ammonium nitrate, which is like, yeah, fertilizer. And what we're talking about here is sodium nitrite. And I can just talk about it quickly now. There's cure number one, that's sodium nitrite. It's 6.25% sodium nitrite and the rest is table salt. So it's a very small amount of nitrite in the product altogether. And then it's used in very small quantities to treat meat. And what it does is prevents botulism. So botulism is a bacteria that creates toxic spores. And in the presence of nitrite, those spores will insist, creating a membrane around them that makes them, you know, they're safe and you're safe from them. So they're still passing through your body, they're just not harmful to you. Um, sodium nitrite nitrate is cure number two. Um, and that is like 4% nitrate, 6% nitrite, and the rest table salt. Nitrate breaks down into nitrite. So it's, you're essentially getting to the same place with both of those products, but you use cure number two when you're curing something for a longer time. It's, think of it as a slow release pill. So you get the nitrite that's there is gonna start acting with bacteria right away and then there's nitrate breaking down to be available later in the process. You can ensure like a clean cure the entire way through. So since I wanted to hang that pancetta for a longer amount of time, I put nitrate in it instead of nitrite. The bacon just has nitrite in it. I could leave nitrite out of this bacon because it's gonna be cooked. So anytime you cook something, you're eliminating botulism anyway. Um, and other things like staph or, or problematic stuff. I kept it in there because this was just a tub of regular master cure. Maybe I wanted to use it on something I wasn't going to be cooking. Um, a lot of people will make an argument for using nitrite just to keep color. That's less of an issue for me, you know. Um, I don't think it's dangerous to eat cured meats that are made with nitrites and nitrates. I think it would take, I think the stats and the research show that it would take sitting down and eating 20 pounds of cured meat in one sitting to even risk a toxic dose, not even a lethal dose of nitrite. It takes not even one micrometer of botulism to kill you. So this is like a really easy decision for me. Celery juice powders and celery juice extracts are not consistent. It's really hard and there's no research done to show how they're acting, if they're acting evenly, how much it really takes to act on this much meat and for this amount of time. So it's a little bit risky to use those products. Um, it's not really, it, where I come from in the commercial world of doing this, it's sort of like, it's like laughed at. It's like, why would you do that? You know, it's just not. But I get it. I'm not laughing. I get wanting to find a more natural source of nitrite and nitrate. Um, another thing I like to mention to people, and this is sort of going off on my little soapbox, but I like to think about everything holistically. Our bodies are ecosystems. Our farms are ecosystems. We, we are part of the nitrogen cycle. Like, we are able to process nitrosamines, a little bit of nitrite, nitrate. Isn't it interesting that the foods that put nitrate and nitrite into our bodies, which the reason we're worried about it when we compartmentalize everything, we're worried about it because it binds to hemoglobin. But isn't it interesting to think about how all the foods that are putting nitrite and nitrate into our bloodstream are also foods that provide us with lots of iron? So like, it's just really not something that you can look at you know, from little, in little boxes. You, know, you have to sort of expand your view. Nitrates are found in celery, the stems of leafy vegetables, especially if they aren't grown in adequate light. So you could easily die eating, more easily eating celery than you could eating cured meat products. Additionally, as the product is curing, all those nitrites, nitrates are metabolizing. So there's only a tiny amount in there to begin with, and then they're breaking down throughout the process. So what you're actually ingesting at the end of the day, it's really hard to say. I've never measured it, but I just think like all the brouhaha about nitrites is potentially dangerous. Um, and I know a lady who got botulism recently. From carrots, not meat. And have you heard and do you have any thoughts on the thoughts? Uh, some people have speculated that pancreatic cancer is linked to cured meats. Have you heard that? I haven't heard that. Well, it may, so cured meats or cooked meats? Cured meats. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know anything more about it. What about nitrate meats? Like, um, nitrate's being cumulative. And what about after they're cooked? Well, when they're cooked, the danger is nitrosamines, which is what is bonding to the hemoglobin in your blood. So it's reportedly reducing your body's ability to oxygenate your blood. Um, and there really aren't any studies that prove that that's what's causing cancer. 
um, but it is speculated. Certainly everything in moderation. I'm not a meat crazed woman. I don't sit around and eat meat all the time. You know what I mean? Honestly, I think it's better to eat a little bit of charcuterie now and then than to eat a freaking eight ounce steak, you know, once a day or more. You know what I mean? Portion control is like a major issue in our country when it comes to our meat supply. And it's one of the reasons why our meat industry is so messed up because we are demanding gross demand for, for rare muscle commodity like back meats, you know, that they don't, you know, there's only, one, there's only one hanger steak on a cow. Why is it on the menu at the restaurant just down the road here? I bet you it is, you know? So that's like, you know, that's something that Pat actually sort of enlightened me to. He's like, I don't really eat meat, but when you give me charcuterie, it's like that great, like, just, just that bite. That's all I need, you know? I don't need, and it's, it's opened up my mind to the fact, like, I'm always talking about portion control when I'm teaching butchery. Stop cutting everything so big. But it's also, it's a great argument for charcuterie, too. You know, just reteaching people how to think about meat, how to think about a meal, how to build a plate. Um, so anyways, that was a bit of a tangent. Yeah. We totally are clueless to the fact that our vegetables are not being harvested in the wintertime with any thought to the fact that those that are harvested on cold, dark days, especially nitrates. if they've been fed chemical fertilizers, are probably through the roof. Higher in nitrates. In nitrates. Yeah. So you could be getting more from your industrial vegetables. Totally that you're getting from any processing. Um, okay, so there's a few more things. Okay, I think I mentioned most of this. The degree of salt and the length of the cure for both dry and wet cures is really determined by the type and the size of the meat. So a general rule is for smaller cuts like a belly um, or a shoulder, one day per pound and cure. If it's a larger thing like a ham or a leg, three days per pound in cure is a nice general rule. Um, there's combination cures. So a ham could be pumped with a brine and then dry cured on the outside before it's smoked. So it could be both wet and dry cured. Um, and then there's some examples at the bottom of whole muscle cures. Prosciutto brazole, which we're going to taste later. That's made with a beef eye of round. That one is cured with coffee and black pepper and rosemary, pancetta, which we looked at. Um, another combo technique is the dry cure pork shoulder that's then stuffed in a beef bung and fermented. That's capicola. Um, Loma we talked about a little bit before. So we've talked a little bit about smoking, so I thought I would give you some more details on that. That's on the next slide. There's three different types. Cold smoking, which is the most traditional, is that smoking that's basically just air drying the meat. It's always done typically below 75 degrees with light intermittent smoke. It's like Laura Ingalls Wilder style where they've got the hollow tree and mama starts a fire and they put the meat in and then they walk away and they do their thing and the fire goes out but they don't care and then they come the next day and they start another fire. So it can take weeks to do this. It's okay if the fire goes out. It's okay if it's not strong because what you're really doing is you're exposing the meat to the properties of the smoke so it won't go rancid but you want it to slowly dry out and not ever be in direct contact with the heat and not ever cook. Um, one step up from that is warm smoking, which uses intermediate smoke, usually indirect heat, um, moderate smoking times, a few days, a day, um, usually no higher than 140 degrees. That's the hardest one to do, if you ask me. Just keeping in that middle ground, it's really tough. Um, and then hot smoking, which is your bacon, your tasso, that's usually thick smoke like hickory, mesquite, because the type of wood affects the type of smoke you're going to get. Um, indirect or direct heat for hot smoking. Short smoking times. You can get a bacon off the grill in four or six hours. Um, and the temperatures are 140 to 220. I don't really like to smoke anything above 200 degrees. But people you know, will take it up to 220, depending. Um, there's more detail about that in other places. It's really Smoking is like a whole... Like a week long intensive. Yeah, totally. Um, so we'll go. What's our time? Anybody know? 20 till 8. Oh, good. We may have time to do. Um, no, 8 is our stop time. Okay. Okay, so we'll talk about fermented meats really fast. Um, so I have nitrite on my hands and it's funny. Um, so fermented meats are usually, well, they, they can be whole muscles. Um, but ground products are really often fermented. That's going to be your salamis. We have one to sample today. It's uh, fennel and nutmeg salami. Recipes in the book. 
Um, it's turned out really well. Um, so these fermented meats are basically, it's, it's a, it's a multi-phase process. It depends on the activity of bacteria and the tools we use to favor or exclude them. Um, so there are certain beneficial bacteria that come in at the beginning of the process. That's the lactobacilli, the same stuff working on our sauerkraut, as well as, I believe it's pediococcus. Those two genuses are the primary ones responsible for fermentation. And once, so they're, what they're doing is they're eating the sugars and the sweets in the meat, and then they're converting them to alcohols and lactic acids. It's the exact same thing that's going on in vegetable ferments. Um, and then once those sweeteners, once that food runs out for them, they're gonna start to die off. And then another two groups of bacteria are gonna start to take over. And these are the curing bacteria. They're responsible for the color, the flavor, and you know, acting with bacteria to actually carry that cure on forward. So those are the Coceria, they're formerly called Micrococcus, and Staphylococcus, not the bad kind, but the good kind. Um, and those processes are not discrete. So it's not like fermentation stops, and then at that moment, curing begins. They sort of overlap a little bit. And it's pretty fascinating, some of the studies that I've done to watch like what happens to pH, what happens to temperature, what happens to the, the physical properties of the sausage as those processes are fading in and out of each other. And Pat and I have had some really awesome discussions about watching that happen in a bread ferment, for example. Um, I was talking about how I made these potato buns, and I put the yeast and the sugar in with the water and just let it sit there and it started to rise, and I got this perfect dome on top of it, and that's when I added everything else. And he was like, that's the perfect time. And so we theorized that is when the fermenting bacteria are start, they're just peaking and they're gonna die. And if you wait after that and let them die, then it's gonna affect the flavor. So if you hit it right at that critical time, you're gonna get supreme bread, which is just really flavor. cool. It'll affect the actual rise. Totally. Yeah, it might be awesome that they're making things that inhibit the rise. It's oh, not totally. Just about the life of the bacteria, it's also the things they make. Totally. Yeah. And so that second group of bacteria in a cured meat product, they're the, they're the real kickers. They're the ones that we don't find in a lot of the cured meat products that we buy because what, what we're doing in, in, when we've modernized charcuterie is that we're trying to speed up the process and make it really predictable. So we add all these crazy sweeteners and we add all these acidifying agents and we, we want to ensure fermentation happens. We want to make it really quick and we hike those temperatures up. Um, and then we're done. But those other bacteria that are flavoring and curing, they require those lower pHs, they require time. So any of those salamis that you're buying, you know, just around town or wherever, are never, ever, ever gonna have the flavor of what you can make at home or what you're gonna be getting in Italy if you go over there. Um, it's just not the traditional process. So the way that it works with fermentation, the higher the temperature, the faster it goes, the more sweetener there is, the faster it goes. The faster it goes, the more sour it gets. So if you are trying to speed up that fermentation process, you're gonna get a more sourly product. So then you gotta load in a bunch of other different types of sweeteners like maltose that slows fermentation or like, you know what I mean? It just gets really crazy. That's where you get all these additives from. But very, very traditional cured meat products were made with very low amounts of sweetener. The only starter culture was from back slopping, which is when they took a little bit of this and put it in the new batch to ensure that they had the culture there which is mostly frowned upon today for reasons you can probably guess. And then a long, just a long amount of time, you know, just be patient, let it go. Um, and then again, anytime you're fermenting, hanging anything, you want it to lose 30, 40% of its weight. That's the ideal. You can get a pH meter and test the pH and that would be like your really, really safe bet. But those are gonna be, a pH meter that allow you to probe right into the center of the sausage is gonna cost you $300, $350. Um, so really weight is the best measure. Um, this Again, is fermented and fresh, yeah? Not fermented. What's that? I was trying to figure out how to do fermented and dried. Uh, but then you have to put nitrates in at some point, right? Mm hmm So like after the fermentation? Nope. You put it in when you're grinding. Oh, you do? So you basically are just making a sausage. So it won't affect the fermentation, the, the nitrates? Mm-mm. Oh, okay. Nope. They are, the nitrites are working with bacteria. Right. They're working to inhibit, they're working to inhibit botulism and they're working with some other bacteria in the meat, I can tell you exactly which ones they are right now. But the, ba the bacteria that are actually curing the meat are working with some of the same proteins that, a that activate when you cook meat. Okay. You know, that's why you're getting good color right. when you cure a meat, just like the meat gets brighter or a different color when you cook it, you know, mm -hmm. um, especially if it's rare. 
Um, and again, in this process, dehydration, the drying out, the activity of salt, the reduction of water activity, that's what is making the product shelf stable. The bacteria are doing the fermentation and the curing, the flavoring, the coloring. Did you have a question? Yeah, what kind of casing would you use for like the salamis or pepperoni type fermentation? I recommend if you're doing a salami for the very first time, use a natural hog casing. You'll get a really quick hang time, three, four weeks, and you'll know. You'll have a, you'll have a salami, you'll be done. Um, I love to do salamis in beef middles. Those are my favorite natural casings for salamis. That's what this fennel nutmeg product is done in. It's going to be about two, three inches diameter. It's non-edible. comes from the large intestine as opposed to the small intestine. Um, so you'll stuff it in and ferment it and dry it and then you want to peel it off before you eat it. Um, you can get synthetic casings for that as well. Um, beef bungs are also used for uh, capicola. Um, yep, we get a few Snickers every time in that one. And you, you, know, you can just stuff them by hand. The thing about bungs is that they're not uniform. So there's going to be a narrow end and a larger end. And if you want it to be uniform, you just cut that narrow end off, tie it at the end, use it just like a regular casing. Um, and those are, does have their place for sure. They're very thick, very substantial. Um, but beef metals are my favorite for salami. Anytime I'm doing a whole muscle and hanging it, I try to get away without a casing if I can. Sometimes I'll get a bladder or something. Like um, if I'm doing a culatello or like a big ham, I'll put in a hog bladder. But if I'm doing like a brazol or a lomo or a pancetta, I just use cheesecloth. You get a really nice funky rind on it that way, which you want, you know? Colors, yay. When you use those cheesecloths, do you wash and reuse? Not when I'm, not when I'm curing with them. Yeah, Sometimes what I do is I use them to inoculate my cabinet, so I'll take a casing or a cheesecloth off something that I've cured and soak it in tepid water and put that water in a spray bottle and spray it in my cabinet. It's kind of like back slopping except you're not putting it in the edible product, you're just putting it in your cabinet. So if you're weirded out by starter cultures, that's one way to inoculate your product is just inoculate your cabinet, make sure that the good stuff is in there. Um, but if your humidity gets off a little bit, you can get funky molds. Yeah. And funky molds are not bad for you, they can just create weird flavors. So it's a gamble. But sometimes I'll use those for that. I definitely use my beef middles for that. Um, so yeah, the, basically the tools that we use when we're fermenting, making fermented meats, are temperature. You want to keep it in an ideal range. Bacteria, both harmful and beneficial, just like you, thrives in a specific range of temperatures. Lucky for us, the bad ones have a much lower rate of tolerance for temperature, salt, and pH than the good ones do. Um, so if we keep it in a nice, temperature range, if we keep our humidity right so that we're getting an even cure, it's not drying out too fast on the inside and getting sloppy on the uh, outside and sloppy on the inside. We want salt up to three to three and a half percent in fermented sausages. You want to get it as salty as possible so that it's inhospitable to those bad bacteria, but you don't want it to be too salty to eat. Also they're going to be served cold, so you want it to be, you want enough salt to dry it out and also taste the salt at the end. Um, we use nitrites, one teaspoon per five pounds of meat, or if you're using sodium nitrite nitrate, you can use four teaspoons per five pounds of meat. We use sweeteners. Dextrose is the most commonly used. That's basically straight glucose. It's very fine. It ferments quickly. It's easy to disperse throughout the product. Note that dextrose is a product from corn. So if you're concerned about GMOs, you need to be sourcing organic dextrose. Butcher Packer does not have it. You have to get it from Now Foods or there's a couple sources on my website um, for it that you can look up. It's not, it's not bad. It's not like exorbitantly more expensive than regular dextrose. Um, <coughs> some people use other sugars as well. Um, like in my capicola, I just use regular cane sugar. I like that really old, traditional, low sweetener, light sweetener, let the bacteria do the work. Um, Would molasses be okay? Have you tried that? Well, I don't know. I've never tried molasses in a cured product. I would be a little bit nervous about it. Honey, definitely not. It harbors botulism, in case you didn't know. Um, stevia? I don't know about stevia. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe. You'd have to just look up what the, what the effective sugar is in it. Is it, what would it be in maple syrup or molasses? <clears throat> would it be sucrose? Would it be glucose? I don't know. I need to do more research on that. Um, people do maple syrup in in cured and cooked products like bacon, that's no problem. But in like a, a long-term hanging fermented product, I would just be a little bit nervous about it. Um, 
Starter cultures, I think it's okay. I think they're fine to use them. It's good to make sure you have the right bacteria in there at the right time, particularly the fermentation bacteria. TSPX starter culture is the one that's gonna give you the most traditional cure. They make a bunch of different ones. Um, and then obviously you want proper sanitation. Staph sucks. If you have bad, dirty working conditions, you can get staph infections from cured products. One other thing I want to mention is, what was it? Oh, you can get a mold, which I, put, I did put on, because I was curing in the summertime and I was getting weird fuzzy molds, mm -hmm. I got this product called Bactoform 600, which is a penicillium strain, and I, I dipped all the salamis in it. And that's, if you see the salamis with that nice white mold on the outside, that's what that is, it's a penicillium product. And what that does is it's, it's, got, it's got a specific flavor that people want in salami, but it also is a really competitive mold competitive beneficial mold, so it'll outcompete a lot of the nasty ones. Um, a lot of people say, oh, I wipe with vinegar when I'm getting bad molds. And I think it's fine, like when you first put the sausages into ferment, give them a wipe with distilled vinegar. But if you keep wiping with vinegar, you're just, you're wiping the slate clean every day, every two days, and you're opening the door for bad bacteria. That's one of the worst things we've done in our society is eliminate all life, right? And so when we're doing fermentation, you don't ever want to fight nature. So always vinegar washing, I think, is a bad, bad practice. If you have really crazy molds, I just say back to firm 600. That's your best bet. Just put some white mold on the outside of it. Um, and that's generally it. We'll open for questions. Take a look at the book if you're interested. It covers a lot of different stuff and includes a lot of recipes. You can follow me on Facebook or Twitter. I have no Twitter followers. Please follow me. And I'm on Instagram. Thank you. Uh, how long will natural cases last in that's a good question. I've never had any go bad on me in the time that I use them. They're just in the salt. They're in salt. Yeah. It's not water, it's just salt. I should have brought mine so you could look at them. It's just like, yeah, dry salt. Mm -hmm. I had inquired with my butcher when we were um, butchering one of our pigs um, about curing my own hands. And he had suggested that if I wanted to, uh, if I was going to freeze it, not, not to freeze it first because ice crystals could form in the muscle and then you could end up, you know, ruining your cure. Mm -hmm. what, what do you have to say about that? I think he's probably a really good butcher. Okay. That's just like something that butchers always say, you know, anytime you freeze, you want the meat to be as fresh as possible, you know. I think that's fine. I've cured hams without freezing them before. Um, I'm not that worried about trichina. Mm -hmm. I think it's super rare on commercial farms. If I was working with a lot, a lot of venison, maybe I would do it. You know, if I was slaughtering wild hogs, I might think about it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it just depends on what's more important to you. If you're worried about your kind of, freeze the meat. If you're more worried about flavor and just having everything be like perfect, use I fresh meat wasn't as possible. Worried about Trichina. Oh, I what was, was wanting it? more, but it's a great point. I was wanting more to um, do it later because yeah. we were butchering at the wrong time of year to mm -hmm. be fine, yeah. to be smoking or not yeah. to be smoking but to be curing and and hanging. And so um, I and was going to freeze it and right. then do it and he said, "Well, it's probably not going to be great if, it, if you freeze it first because it'll I have... I think he's probably a real, he's a purist. I think you are working in reality. And the reality is that even in butcher shops, people can't get through product as fast as they need to. They have to freeze it. I have made many a delicious ham from frozen product. Mm -hmm. It does not... It's not a rule that it's going to ruin the cure. Yeah. yeah. But anytime, yeah, like changing the structure of the protein, um, you know, ice will do that. You know, it will, it will push into the meat. It will damage the, you know, specific musculature of that cut. Mm -hmm. But is it going to be noticeable to you? I doubt it, you know. And same with the fresh bacon. If it was frozen. I think it'll be fine. To cure it later. I think it'll be totally fine. Okay, good. Yeah. Good also, if you want to cure a whole bunch of bacon and smoke it, put it in the freezer after that. It keeps marvelously well mm -hmm. in the freezer. I'm going to pass around food. All right. This is a hammock of sausage. Okay. Um, <laughs> Staph comes from dirty working conditions. It's an aerobic bacteria, so it will grow on the outside of a casing. If you had a dirty work environment or if stuff got too warm, it's pretty rare, you know. But if you're just like, you know, 
doing everything outside or not washing your hands or whatever. You know, it's just something to think about. Keep things as cold as possible. If you're slaughtering and then processing, like making sure you have different knives for processing as opposed to slaughtering when you're messing with the intestines and the bung and all that stuff, you know what I mean? That's the biggest concern with staff. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, plates, look at this. We can also pass this around. So just again, put it all on this pot, just load them up on the oh, okay, loading them up on the plate. So what we're working with here, I think I told you, it's a bologna. This here is a fennel nutmeg salami. So it was, it was um, ground with nitrite, salt, nutmeg spices, and then it was fermented for about a month, maybe a little bit more, in a beef middle. And then this is a beef brazil. It's a beef eye of round that was dry cured. Um, I think it was like 18 days in the refrigerator, wrapped in cheesecloth, and then hung. Um, actually, after I cured it, I rolled it in coffee grounds, and then I wrapped it and hung it. You can't really taste the coffee, but it sounds sexy. Wow. So. Might have to stay awake. Yeah. <laughs> Is that sauce dressed with peanut butter? It's not. I can give it to you again if you want. Is There's the beef brazil um, recipe is in the book. There's a bologna recipe in the book. The fennel nutmeg salami recipe is in the book. Um, there's a lot of sausage recipes in the book, but that particular sure one is not there. So that was say, delicious. I'll say it. Do you like it? Yeah. I could take a frozen one and mm -hmm. it. Totally. Okay. That's a brazil. Okay. The darker one with the, out, the dark outer rim is a beef brazil. This is pig. That's beef. The rest of yours and be done. I'm worrying about it. You can make a great venison brazil. Yeah, that's what I need to know about. Uh-huh. I did, a, I did a venison salami recently with uh, garlic scapes and fermented dried celery leaves and a little bit of nitrate and salt and garlic and pepper. It was really good. Um, that one we did in hog casings. Okay, did somebody want the sausage recipe again? Mm -hmm. Two and a half pounds of pork lean. Uh huh. One pound of pork fat, back fat. One ounce of kosher salt. 0. 0.7. One pound of back fat. One ounce. Then you want 0. 0.7 ounces black pepper, ground. Um, that would say about three tablespoons of uh, minced fresh garlic. I don't know what that works out to ounces, ounces wise. And then I just threw in some thyme. You know what, tablespoon? I don't know, two tablespoons, whatever you think. And then three quarters cup of white wine, dry white wine. Three quarters cup. Mm -hmm. So there was no cayenne? No cayenne, just black pepper. Just black pepper. Wow. Does it taste spicy? Yeah, basically. The garlic might be making that happen too. Ooh. Throwing things. <laughs> Any other questions? I love to talk about your cabinet and like totally. It's hard to talk about the cabinet in a presentation. Like I do a PowerPoint about it, but it's like wiring work. And then I've been traveling, and like it's already hard enough to take your knives on a plane. If you take a little gray box with a bunch of wires in it, they start asking lots of questions. <laughs> so it's like, you know. Just leave it alone. Yeah. Um, but I'd be happy to send you the plans. I, if you email me and remind me, I'll email you the diagrams. Because it has to have the right amount of moisture. And yeah, it's basically about temperature. temperature. So what you're doing is taking a refrigerator, and then you're uh, tricking it by, ex by hooking up an external thermostat, an external hygrometer, or coolness humidifier that's attached to an external hygrometer. And you're telling it to stay between 50 and 60 degrees and you know between 65 75 percent humidity the one struggle i think with homemade cabinets is going to be air speed especially around here the humidity getting too high which is not a terrible thing it's way worse to have too low of humidity than to have too high of humidity the problem with high humidity is that you get funny molds and you can get off flavors so increasing your air speed is what is going to help with that so you can put fans in there you can cut cut holes in the side and put fans in there um, that's something i've struggled with a little bit in my homemade cabinet I'm using a refrigerator. You do, and actually, if you use a refrigerator with the freezer chamber above, 
Um, you can't, it won't stay the same, so you don't want to cure meats up top, but I've heard that the top portion is really good for aging cheeses because it stays at 85% humidity, about 10 degrees above what you have your cabinet, and that's ideal for aging cheeses. I haven't tried it yet. My, my cabinet is a continuous chamber refrigerator. It doesn't have that upper freezer, so I haven't done the cheeses yet. Awesome. Yeah. I'd love to email you for the plan. Yeah, totally. Do it. My email is not on here, but it's just Mayor Lee Food, which is written there, at gmail.com. Yeah, okay. I don't cover smokers in the book. I, I just talk about the principles of cold, warm, and hot smoking and different types of wood you can use for each one. Um, we're going to build a cold smoker this fall at Living Web, so help me. And uh, you know, maybe we'll put the plans up or something and cook some food and video it or something, you know. Cold smoking is the way to go, if you ask me. Cold smoke your life away. Yeah. In Alaska, there was a guy who put cold smoke with salmon. He was trying to get it so he could set up his hand out and play like, on the door and cold smoke with the table. But he would he took it, he's like check it out. Cold smoking is below 75 degrees with indirect heat, light, intermittent smoke. Yeah. Um, you can make a cold smoker out of a cardboard box. Get yourself a box, put the meat inside, put a little computer fan in this side of it, get yourself one of those flexible dryer tubes, put it you know, in another box, get a hot plate with a cast iron on top, heat up some wood chips, and send that heat right through there. You can smoke your bacon in a cardboard box. Smoke it in a kitchen cabinet, you know? Put it in a terracotta pot, like whatever, you know? Cold smoking is the way to go. You can do it very, very easily. If anybody wants to see silver skin, there is a tiny bit on the back side of this knife. Well, maybe not. It's silver skin? It's going to be that fine, fine tissue that's on the, yeah, this, I trimmed it pretty well. Um, but you can see, like, it's stringy, and it's just a bad, like, eating experience if it gets into your sausage. Yeah. And then like anything that's getting caught by the grinder that's going to turn the meat bad, you see those black things like gristle, glands, oh. the grinder's catching all that. If that had gone into my grind, it wouldn't have stored for any period of time. You know, it just would have turned the grind immediately rancid. So that's why it is nice to have a good piece of equipment. You know what I mean? I think they do to an extent. They just don't do as good of a job as a mechanical grinder. Keeping the um, the parts sharp is really important, you know. You can. With my knives, I just replace them. You know, I like to replace them a lot. You could file them, you know. I just don't know, like, would they be all wonky and how long would that last? You know what I mean? Um, also, having sharp knives. It's fundamental, you know. If you don't have sharp knives, it's really hard to trim well. So I brought my honing steel. You should absolutely have a honing steel, which is this. This is a stainless steel honer. You can get diamond, you can get ceramic. Um, if you're not hip to knife sharpening, we'll just do a quick demo. Most knives are beveled at a 20 degree angle. So this is 90, this is 45, this is 20. So anytime you're honing or sharpening, you want that angle. I see so many people getting the wrong angle on their hone or their sharpen, and it's not going to give you a sharp knife. So when I'm doing this, I really want that really 20 degree angle. This honing, your knife, even though it doesn't look like it, it's just like a serrated knife. It has tons of tiny little teeth. When you're honing, you're just bending those teeth back into alignment. When you're sharpening, you're actually taking metal off. So you want to hone more than you sharpen. The more you sharpen, the more you degrade your knife, right? You do want to sharpen. I use an oil stone. It's very easy to do. Probably should put a YouTube video of that sooner than so later. So you sharpen still at a 20 degree angle? Yes. And then you, and then you hone, oh, which is oh. back and forth. Mm -hmm. I'll hone before I use my knife every time. If I know I'm about to break a whole animal, I'll sharpen before I do it, you know. Um, 
This is a six inch <coughs> semi-flexible boning knife. It's a Forstner Victoria Knox. I like these. Also, Dix makes good knives. If you get a bunch of fat on the handle, your hand's not going to slip off of it. It's got a really good grip. Um, I have a also 13 inch hand forged full tang scimitar that was made by my friend G. It's a kind of people use that synonymously with a breaking knife or a scimitar or a butcher knife. You don't, you only need one. Um, it's good to have 12 or 13 inches if you're working with beef or larger animals. Um, some people just have a 10 inch breaking knife if they're just working with um, lamb or poultry. But yeah, I also have a boning knife that's stiffer. It's a Messermeister. And that's really good for doing like really fine trim work on the table after you've cut out retail cuts and you want to get silver skin off. It's so much easier to skin. It's so much easier to take silver skin off, take fascia off with a stiffer knife than a more flexible knife. This is your boner. This is like what's going around all the really fine contours of vertebrae and the ends of the femurs and stuff like that. Um, this is like not an expensive knife. Really important to have. Really good for whole chicken. <coughs> No, Dix is one brand. This is Forstner Victoria Knox. This is my favorite for the stamped knives. And you can get this from Butcher Packer. Speaking of um, chicken, have you done any cured like poultry or fish or anything? Um, I would love to cure some fish. <coughs> cured poultry freaks me out. <laughs> poultry freaks me out in general. The bacterial load on that stuff is insane. I love to make chicken sausage. By the way, make chicken sausage with chicken skin, not pork fat way better. Just a quick tip. A lot of people in chicken sausage recipes will tell you to use the chicken lean meat and then you add pork fat, but it's way better to just use the chicken lean meat and then the chicken skin as your fat source. Get as much fat off the chicken as you can, but if you're using heritage birds like you should be, it's not going to have a lot of fat on it. Just use the skin and that's going to be your fat source. And it usually works out about right. If you debone an entire chicken, you're going to get a certain amount of lean off of it and then using all the skin plus maybe a little bit more is going to give you the right amount, the right ratio for a chicken sausage. And if you're using free range chicken, you're getting really good fat. Yeah. What little there is. Yeah. Same for duck. You can use the skin. And they have a lot of fat on them. Anything else? Any questions? Thank you. Did everyone get samples? Is this for me? Ooh. That's gonna want to try this off.